specify accordingly. But there's some integration across this. And, and so during my, um, oops, my slides aren't advancing now. They were a minute ago, okay. Um, the cancer control and prevention training that I've received, I really wanna make sure we cover this full um, spectrum because I'll talk about primary prevention as well as um, studying or doing research in survivor populations where we're looking at secondary prevention um, and then also using um, diagnostic capacities, for example, leveraging colonoscopies to understand how we can look at metabolites in colon tissue. And I will not be addressing any um, of our work in the treatment area today. Also, I think I put down here some of these other cross-cutting areas that I'd like to emphasize. Um, I'll, we've bridged into working mostly with foods into also incorporating physical activity and um, trying to understand individual precision nutrition kind of opportunities as well as studying it at a population scale. So the, looks like I'm gonna have to advance this way. All right, so if you go on to any of your general Cancer Research Foundation websites, this is one from AACR, you can see that the number is pretty much, they say 30% of ca cancers in the United States could be um, accounted for due to poor diet, lack of physical activity, being overweight and obese. And so it doesn't always tell us the reverse direction in terms of how many we could control or prevent if we managed these things. And that's what I want to emphasize today. And that's where our group has been trying to take more of an approach of taking a lot of the same information you're getting, but turning it on to what are the things you can do. And if you follow these things, um, all these 10 recommendations, what are, and the data are looking very good in terms of your chances are up to 50% now in terms of certain types of cancers and reducing risk. I put number four here in red because I'm gonna talk a lot about this today and this recommendation on whole grains and legumes specifically and how they call out a food, um, particularly the food beans. And so this is from AACR in 2012, but there's a very similar list of 10 items today. And the major area I just wanna emphasize that this information comes from is this not just one study, but many different epidemiological studies, and this one in particular being the NIH AARP um, prospective cohort, where they showed that whole grains and legumes can significantly lower all-cause mortality over a nine-year period. And that was a very strong finding, particularly because it came a decade after reports such as these two highlighted here from the New England Journal of Medicine, where it's showing that in randomized control trial settings, they were not able to find a relationship between some of these healthy foods, such as a wheat bran fiber or um, high fiber fruits and vegetables in the with the outcome of risk for recurrence of colorectal adenomas. And so the question became, you know, what is going on here when you see results um, in one direction and maybe even times after these randomized controlled trials. And so now our approach is to take a look, not just at genetic factors that may be playing a role in terms of trials not having these results, epigenetics, but also the understanding about the microbiome has become more apparent during this time frame. And what are ways that we could do clinical trials moving forward that are going to not um, have such conflicting results, but also reveal mechanisms of action? So we went next to this idea of whole grains and le legumes acting through so many different types of mechanisms for this reduced chronic disease outcome. And you can find really important literature supporting these different mechanisms that I've outlined here and that all of these things contribute to a healthy weight. Our area of particular interest is this gut microflora metabolism, but as I mentioned, we'll be using things like metabolomics where we can get a suite of small molecule signatures to also understand lipid and carbohydrate me metabolism, reductions in inflammation, antioxidants that may combat oxidative stress, and so really working full circle here. And as I've mentioned, the other information that's been coming out with respect to the microbiome in the last many, many if, over the last decade, I would say more so in colorectal cancer, has been these microbiome sequencing studies characterizing different populations. And now here are some studies that are combining information across countries with colorectal cancer. So the idea being, how could we get a handle on some of the different microbial communities that are playing risks um, all, all over the place? 
And the next piece, not just identifying what those microbes are, but being able to put people into different clusters. And so what this study did, and I'll just highlight it, but I wanna bring us again to the meta metabolism and lifestyle pieces that are the outcomes from this study. They saw four different clusters of microbial community relationships in different countries that they further broke down into tumor locations. So right versus left. I'm gonna emphasize this more and more and versus rectal cancers. So colorectal cancer showing a spectrum there. There's definitely sex differences that are being revealed in colorectal cancer right now. And then of course stage, whether or not you're detecting the cancer early in its early stages versus later stages. All of these things playing a role in the relationship between microbiomes and colorectal cancer. But the interpretation of this, not so much just which microbes is, and, and I put these two bullet points here, which is gonna really launch what I wanna talk about today, which is that amino acid degradation, shifting of carbohydrate utilization by the microbiome, as well as microbiomes that are associated with increased uh, meat consumption and low fiber intake. So studies are studying which microbes are related to colorectal cancer progression. And then we have separate sets of studies that are also looking at microbial communities that are modulated by diet and lifestyle. And now we need to think about how can we merge these two things so that we could ideally promote control and prevention of colorectal cancer. So this is how our lab has taken upon um, this task and identifying dietary microbiome mediated mechanisms of gut function and using metabolomics, but ideally, it, and I'll bring it right to the metabolism. And so in foods themselves, we can apply these metabolite profiling techniques where we can understand what are all the different primary and secondary metabolites. And some foods yield hundreds and hundreds of compounds that we can now identify. And we've heard a lot about prebiotics that are important for seeding healthy beneficial microbes, but it's also the metabolism by the microbiome, the biotransformation that occurs and the phytochemical or plant diversity that occurs that we would like to, to evaluate further. So that's really just the framework in which we're working under. And so over the last decade or so here in Northern Colorado, we've been able to do food interventions in children, eight to 12 years old that have uh, been flagged by our, um, in their school systems as having elevated cholesterol. And so we were in, in met, a work has been published for many of these. I'm gonna move more towards work that's unpublished and that we're doing now, but I wanna set the stage that we have done a trial called Benefit in Cancer Survivors. With foods, we worked with um, our local surgeons here to collect colon tissue from surg for surgery to apply metabolomics. And then with the Colorado School of Public Health, we've gone right into grocery stores and provided information about whole grains and legumes. And this is that full cancer control continuum that I'm talking about, that it's not just about the randomized control trials or just the um, sample analysis, but also some of the public health messaging that's needed in this area. So let's now get down to the, make sure we're all on the same page about legumes. And so here's a number of legumes, not all of them, but some that I wanna talk about today. And I'm gonna be specifically telling you our focus on navy beans. And the way that we've been studying navy beans has been um, in a powder form. So it's the whole beans that have been cooked and dried into a powder so that we can now study this in, in people. Um, so it doesn't change and we have all the composition of the beans. The reason we've been emphasizing beans is again, because it specifically was highlighted in some of the recommendations based on a number of studies that have come out. And our focus on beans is not just about feeding it yet, is we wanna understand what's in them. And so here's an example of the amino acid profile analysis that comes from metabolite profiling or metabolomics. And you can see differences at a very high um, biochemical level for things that are very highly abundant. And so these are just shown, the scale on the y-axis is just telling you the relative abundance of all of these different amino acid compounds. And so I just wanna draw your attention to some of these very high ones like pipicolate that I'll be talking about later, S-methylcysteine, um, methionine. So these are things that maybe after people consume it, now we can start to understand how they're metabolized, not just by the host and the microbiome, but uh, where those molecules are going. And so we've been applying this, not just for beans, but another food that we'll be studying, I'll talk about today, which is rice bran as well. And so rice bran, and so we have, a, this is the bran removed from the whole grain brown rice. So many people have eaten brown rice or white rice, 
and this bran is what's removed. It's very high in uh, fats and lipids, which is why it requires a heat stabilization process before one can consume it. Otherwise, the lipids go rancid. Um, so it's not typically consumed or widely available, but it is emerging in the marketplace now. We found many studies showing rice brands protection against colorectal cancer. And so again, just like we saw this for the beans, we thought let's start to incorporate this whole grain into some of our research. And I'm not gonna go into the details of this, but similar to what we did with beans, where I just showed you the amino acids, this is the full metabolome. And so right here covers all the different lipids that we're able to an analyze, as well as carbohydrates, vitamins and cofactors. And, and we've published on the metabolome of rice bran um, already, if you have interest in more details. So the idea is how do we understand the food that we're putting into the host or into the human body before we um, decide to understand its benefits? And so here's that idea of understanding ingestion, absorption, utilization, and what's bioavailable or bioactive to protect against cancer. But it's this outer circle that um, it's been exciting to really leverage a lot of the experience and strengths at Colorado State University in this area, because um, we have crop sciences, for example, that can understand the genetic differences between some of the different beans, maybe other meal components and their roles um, and this has also been in collaboration with our nutrition department to help design meals and foods and snacks. And we've also, I have a picture of the Metabolic Kitchen down at Anschutz as well. We've been trying to help as many different uh, sources of information for processing and preparation to influence the composition of the foods we wish to study. And then we've talked already how individual characteristics can sometimes influence how um, the outcomes of some of the clinical trials that are being done and epidemiological studies with these foods. So the first trial, as I mentioned, is benefit. And this was there's been publicate, multiple publications from this study already. It was really about demonstrating the feasibility of increasing navy bean and rice bran consumption in people. Again, we did not feel it was important to keep doing animal studies that are showing benefits of these foods until we had shown that people could eat them at those levels. And so that was the goal, was to get people to eat levels that had shown protection in animal studies, and then to look at microbiome and metabolite endpoints. And this was a short-term feedings trial. It was only done for one month, um, but again, at high levels of consumption for these two foods. And so I'll briefly go through and pretty quickly go through some of the results. But the big one, as many people can see when they want to change to a high fiber diet, is their GI symptoms, right? What are, how much flatulence am I going to have? How are we going to, you know, handle this? This is what is a major barrier for why people don't increase fiber in their diet. Not so much that the access to the foods is not there. So we studied these two foods separately compared to a control diet. So as I mentioned, a bean was made into a powder. The rice bran is already a powder and we incorporated them into foods. And we checked over a month period of time and there was no difference between our groups, suggesting that a lot of the um, perceived conditions that people deal with are, are really just that perceived and that there was no difference for a group that did not have a higher fiber diet. Here are just some examples of the foods and snacks in which we are able to blind people and incorporate some of these foods um, without changing too much of the um, caloric content. And so I'll tell you how we've expanded this for our, our current studies. And so briefly, as We've shown already there are changes in microbiomes. Individuals with different microbiomes may have uh, different community changes. And this is just in two and four weeks that we can start measuring some of these changes. And importantly, in the stool, it's not so much just about the microbes that are there, but we're able to see metabolites from, for example, the rice bran. And so we know that they're from the rice bran, may be modified with changes from metabolism um, because we've done the analysis of the bran itself prior to the consumption. And while we're very interested in looking at stool and the gut, we also wanted to look in plasma and urine. And this goes to that multi-matrix metabolite analysis strategy. And so this paper um, showed, and we wanted to not just look at one class of compounds that come from rice bran, but for example, and this is an, an of 10 people in each group, were 10 control participants who ate those meals and snacks 10 participants, and these were all colorectal cancer survivors who ate rice bran in those foods, saw an increase in the number of metabolites in the plasma and the change in the profile of these, the, comp the chemical classes for these compounds. Similarly, we saw in the urine 
differences between our control group and our rice bran group for the number of metabolites across chemical classes. And then we go into detail about what those changes are in these papers. But the big question, as you can imagine, by many of the colorectal cancer survivors that have participated in our study is, well, did one month of eating rice bran do anything for me? Or is it just about you being able to understand the dynamics of how rice bran's working? Um, did I receive any benefit? It's a big question that we were asked after this from just this one month. And of course, the big one, how do I continue to do this? And that's where we struggled a little bit because again, our foods and snacks were things that we made and provided and um, bean powder and rice bran are not widely available in the way that we provided them. But we decided that before we went into that more public health direction of, of how people can continue these diets, we wanted to ask some more mechanistic questions. And so this is, um, the first one was, is there any colon cancer protection from the gut microbiota of those people after they ate one month? Um, of, and I'm gonna separate out rice bran for these studies just for the sake of simplicity and our understanding. And then did the metabolic changes in the human stool, plasma, and urine have any importance to that individual's colorectal cancer control um, continuum that they're on? And then here is the research question, and this is a uh, multi-PI RO1 with Komal Reina and part of some of the collaborations that we've had it in the University of Colorado Cancer Center. And now we've asked, would fecal transplantation into germ-free mice from those individuals that consumed rice bran be protective? And our hypothesis um, is for that study that in fact, we think that the human stool microbiomes after you eat rice bran could have um, efficacy. So this um, was completed also in collaboration with, oops, where it went, okay. Um, with Dr. Christine Kuhn at the um, Anschutz campus in the Nautobiotic facility, where we took samples, and I'm gonna show you results from one of the female colorectal cancer survivors in our study who had a substantial increase in her fiber intake. Um, and we used her stool samples and did a fecal microtransplantation or transplantation into the germ-free mice. And then we assessed their fecal samples. And of course, we looked at colon lesions and wanted to see what, um, what would happen. And in this individual, we did in fact find that her stool sample at the beginning of the study and her stool sample at the end of the intervention did in fact result in a reduction in the number of colon lesion, tumor lesions in that mouse after one month. So just the microbiome itself. We did not continue to feed rice bran in this study. What I'm showing up here in this top panel and this work is um, currently under review, is that the baseline, her baseline stool and her intervention stool, before we put it into the animal, you can see that there's very little differences between them. It's the same person. We don't, eating rice bran for a month won't massively shift your microbiome. Actually, the composition doesn't shift very much. It's the metabolism of it that does. And then what we're showing here is the mouse cecum, distal colon, and proximal colon in triangles and then circles after 13 weeks of consumption. And that you can continue to see that that one individual's baseline and intervention continued to separate in the animal. And now we're evaluating what the role is of those microbes in this protective effect um, on the colon lesions. So we were excited to see this and find out what are all of those taxa involved and how are they contributing to the metabolism in that individual. And so here is just another way you can take a look at a number of the different taxa that are changed between baseline and intervention of the adults that um, we're putting now into the animal model. And so I'm gonna pick a couple of family level taxa um, to show you changes in the animal model over time from this human transplantation. And so we're, as you can see, we have one, three different animal lines. There's six lines here, three that receive the baseline three animals that received the intervention. And now we're tracking this Lachnosporaceae family over time in that fecal sample. And you can see that the intervention in the baseline, same individual but different mice, are ending in a similar place. Then we went to do this with different taxa to understand the dynamics of them working. Again, remember, they're, they're not provided one at a time, they're provided as a community. And so for ruminococcus, um, this is another one where they started out different, but you can see in the animal over the time period, 
the baseline and the intervention actually ended up at the end of the study to be very similar, even though the dynamics over time in the host were the same. And it's, it's important to look at these different taxa for what they're doing metabolically in the animal over time and whether or not we wanna associate them with protection or where they're having a role. Because maybe this taxa is having a role early on in colon carcinogenesis compared to later. And so I'll get a little bit more into detail on this. And so I mentioned those were just microbiota being analyzed for the protection against colon carcinogenesis, but we're also feeding rice bran um, molecules and we're also fermenting with different gut microbes. And so all we're showing again here in an animal model is that over time in a longer term feeding strategy of 14 weeks in this case, that we're able to see many different rice bran compounds in the fecal samples of mice and then we've also shown um, that they are incorporated into the colon tissue itself of the animals. Something that's very difficult to do in people because again, we're only able to get stool samples. It's not something, colon tissue is not something that we're sampling regularly after um, our diet interventions. But I will get to that um, in the next section because ultimately our overarching goals here are to develop and deliver some real practical low cost, accessible interventions for improving cancer control and prevention outcomes um, for people at high risk, um, not just individuals and so uh, who have had cancer previously. So the next trial, unlike the benefit study, we call it beneficial because one of the other critiques we received from our first trial was that we didn't take into account physical activity and maybe changes in metabolism that are occurring due to um, physical activity. And, and also during this time period, physical activity has been shown to be another important factor in protection against colon cancer. And we chose now to identify individuals who are at high risk according to having had um, two or more polyps removed, being stage zero, um, one or two classifications where they would not have undergone chemotherapy or radiation, maybe just surgical removal. Um, and then we also took a look at other risk factors. So the goal of this next trial, and this was um, thankfully supported by a pilot award from the University of Colorado Cancer Center and in collaboration with Dr. Heather Leach, who is um, faculty here in health and exercise science. And so we sought to really move forward with establishing signatures, multiple small molecules that are gut derived, gut directed, so that they could be used as for food exposure markers as well as having uh, protective activities. And so I wanna go into a little bit of detail about this study because it is our, the first time where we've worked towards um, pri working on primary prevention, which is even more difficult. Many of these individuals were scheduled for a follow-up uh, colonoscopy in three and five years after their first one. And that was partly how we recruited from the clinics here. Um, we had, the other important eligibility criteria that I'll emphasize today is just that we do recruit people without food allergies um, because, and that may, and people who are willing to wear an accelerometer in this case in the beginning and end. Um, and also this time we decided to take the study for 12 weeks instead of four weeks to see if we could have, it's possible some people may benefit um, from longer term feeding. The other difference in this trial from our first study was that we included a fiber supplement control, which is a soluble corn um, fiber, and we used Fibersol too. And so we did provide people with a sachet of, um, so both groups were increasing their fiber consumption. And as you can see here, some of our endpoints, um, we were collecting um, at the six weeks changes in the metabolome because we knew we saw things at two and four weeks. The question now is at six weeks and 12 weeks, are we able to still measure changes? And we also measured, um, we have blood draws regularly through those individuals over time. And this study was completed last year and I'm pleased to say will be um, coming out soon in terms of um, in integrative cancer therapies. So that was exciting to get, be able to get at least the trial published. Um, but I will also be sharing a lot of unpublished data on the metabolomics and our findings from this trial. And so basically, as I showed you a series of foods that we did initially in our benefit, we expanded it now. And we even include just the rice bran and bean powders themselves so that people could take those and incorporate them into their own diet instead of always needing to eat our study provided foods. And so you can see the difference between um, the control and intervention foods in terms of calories as well as fiber. 
and individuals were asked to eat at least two foods in one study packet every day for 12 weeks. And then um, we were also trying to make sure and find out we could monitor what their physical activity was during that time period or if there was any change during the courses of the study. And as we saw before in the, when we studied the food separately, now again, remember, we're combining rice bran and navy bean together because we think that we can enhance the effect, the protective effects that we're seeing from these foods separately. And right now this line is showing you the line in animal models that if you achieve that percent intake that, you will, that um, there was protective effects in the animals. So we want to make sure all of our people are getting above that threshold so that we can measure protective effect, the, the mechanisms for protective effects. And our control group has a very low background level of bean and rice bran consumption. Apologies for the manually. So when you want to take a look just at total fiber intakes of this cohort at the end of the study, and this is 21 individuals that we intervened in, and each dot in this is going to be one individual, you can see that we have a very uh, significant increase in fiber in both our groups, which is what we wanted to see, the intervention group being specifically from uh, rice bran and beans. And we did healthy eating index, which is being used uh, widely now, and we were able to not just improve the total score in all of our individuals, but specifically in our intervention group, the whole grain score. And we saw no differences between our groups and over time, we had a, a active population. And so we did, it was uh, exciting to be able to incorporate physical activity um, and all of our participants were meeting physical activity guidelines. All right, and so I'm not gonna belabor all the details here. I just wanna show you that we do look at a number of different nutrients pre and post in both groups over time. And one of the areas that we keep repeatedly seeing improvements in is vitamin B6. And so these B vitamins from rice bran seem to become available um, and a, a significant contribution at the doses that we are intervening. And this is something that we've also been excited and not surprised when we see reductions in cholesterol or LDL, or even we've seen in our children in our previous study improvements with beans and HDL. And so I'm not, I'm just showing some of the other panels here because uh, we do measure more than just the foods themselves. So I want to take us through now the multi matrix metabolomics analysis from this trial. And this is all our pilot analysis in these individuals. And I'm selecting out some components to, to emphasize how the foods can be dually purposed as a exposure marker, but also for protective effects. And so in the urine, for example, I highlighted pipicolate from the beans earlier, we can see that there is no change in our control group, but that we were able to get a significant increase in nearly all of our participants. Um, and a few of them will always not respond, it's possible for different reasons. S-methylcysteine being another example of a compound that we know is in our foods and similarly for methoxyphenol sulfate uh, being derived from our food. So our intervention and being able to measure a metabolite marker from your intervention has been an um, exciting success from this pilot study that we hope to expand now into a larger study. I'm also switching now to plasma. So that was urine. Some of these similar molecules um, that we can also see changing at six and 12 weeks. Um, in addition to some of the molecules that I've highlighted here, we also are looking at unknowns that don't have names because it's possible some of these may be important markers. For example, this 18 fold difference of these very high fold changes that we're seeing and um, we're excited to advance maybe some NMR and some other strategies to start identifying these unknown compounds. And so again, you can just take a look at it as a whole group in a full change or full difference manner over time. But we also do like to look at individuals and maybe understand, I'm highlighting down here, the individuals that are not changing. So the responders and non-responders possibly to our intervention is what we're really trying to get a feel for. And based on these results in 20 individuals, um, we are finding that we need to go up to close to 100 individual, individuals for our uh, next study, 75 to 100 to be able to measure these same things. And so I went to plasma, urine, and now we're in stool, okay, which is um, all extremely important to us also in looking at different compounds that are changing in our control group versus our intervention group over time. And are there good markers to, and this one I find N-methyl leucine is a good one because again, we see this full range of individuals um, 
some that started out with nothing and then some that don't respond and then some that are very high responders to the diet. And then linolate, um, linolate it's also from uh, rice bran and we can see changes there after 12 weeks. So we do find a lot of um, improved results when we go out to 12 weeks of consumption, daily consumption for 12 weeks when compared to findings we've had previously at four weeks. Now, you probably, I haven't said short chain fatty acids yet, but this is the one thing when you think about colonic inflammation that uh, we're repeatedly asked, what about short chain fatty acids? Why aren't you seeing increases or changes in your short chain fatty acids? Well, in stool, as we can all know, it's very difficult to only measure short chain fatty acid differences. We don't see any changes in these over 12 weeks in stool. I'm hopeful they're being produced and utilized by the colon and reducing the inflammation in these individuals. So these are things we can do in the animal models over time and see changes, but we don't see them necessarily in our interventions um, in the stool. Now that goes back to why we want to get to being able to understand changes occurring in human colon tissue now. Um, and that's the next direction at, that I'll be taking us to. Um, but to summarize, I just want to, before I go too far, into the next colon tissue section is I just want to say, look, you know, we've been really trying to understand compounds in the foods, their ability to undergo all kinds of different metabolic changes. We're feeling pretty good. Oh, sorry, this is not there for plasma, about showing plasma, urine, and stool, and many of these different compounds um, changing in these matrices. But where we really want to go is to understand how these foods are influencing the colon tissue. And so we next also not just the colon tissue anywhere, but the right side and the left side. So the ascending and descending colon tumors right now are showing to have differences with poorer prognosis on the right and different um, associations are emerging genetics as well as um, lifestyle factors. And so I'm not gonna put a huge emphasis on all of that information, except for to say we wanted to go back and take a look at what does a healthy colon tissue look like on the right side versus the left side of healthy adults or adults at risk for colon cancer. And so what we did is worked with some of our gastroenterologists locally and we had a small cohort of normal weight, overweight and obese adults that were undergoing routine colonoscopy. And then we started to um, collect them and apply them to metabolomics. And so I just wanna, I'm giving you just a couple here. Um, there is a published report on this that I will reference, but you can see already that here's some lipids, okay? That we can see in normal weight individuals are different between the right and left colon, okay? And that when you become overweight or obese, that the differences between the right and left start to shift, okay? They, they're no longer apparent. And so I, we're wondering if metabolism along the colon um, shifts with weight and obesity and understanding that shift is important and using food molecules might be, might be a strategy as well as other metabolite signatures. And so what we've done, um, and this paper has recently um, come out this year, and we've taken a look beyond just food molecules, but I'm gonna mix them in, but Try uh, methylamine and oxide. We know this is a, a molecule with risk already associated in cardiovascular disease and also emerging so in colorectal cancer. And so we can look on and don't expect in normal adults to have high levels of this molecule. And, and again, influence in choline metabolism. We, don't, we do see higher levels in overweight individuals. And interestingly, we actually see a difference between right and left in obese individuals. And so we're wondering about the relationship we know this molecule has with um, disease progression. And now we're also comparing our findings to what we see in stool. So when we got samples from colonoscopy, it's really important prior to their bowel prep that you also get a stool sample. And you can see here that there was a difference in overweight individuals from normal but not necessarily with obesity. And so this spectrum of overweight to obesity is another thing uh, we have to pay attention to in our studies when looking for changes. I've also put in these other couple lipids where you can see that the right versus left does trend as different for oh, across the overweight and obese spectrum, but that that difference is um, not significant in the overweight and obese when compared to that difference in the healthy um, normal weight controls. And similarly, um, for this uh, ethanol amide, you can see that in the stool, we see increased in um, just overweight populations, but we don't see that difference between right and left in the colon tissue. 
So I think we've learned a lot about and, and desire now more and more to get at colon tissue because I'm gonna point out this one palmitate, which is a fatty acid found in rice bran. Um, again, these are not individuals that we had intervened in. We're just looking at different molecules and what we can detect. But here's an example of where we do, again, see very significant differences between right and left, and that that goes away for this uh, lung, this fatty acid um, that we do know is diet derived. So where does it, where do we take all this information is the big thing, and, and ultimately our direction moving forward is um, is split kind of twofold into we want to continue to be able to deliver phytochemicals from rice bran and beans as examples, um, and to understand the role of physical activity and digestion um, in the microbiota and not just how they transform these for protection against colon cancer, but also to enhance gut mucosal immunity. Um, I have another program of research where we do see protection against certain pathogens in the gut due to mucosal immune responses. And so again, pretty exciting opportunity to now move this into people and look at colon tissue changes in people. And then the second piece, and I pull this out because I showed you this is, the stool samples that were collected from Beneficial, the second study of 12 weeks, have now been um, collected so that we can continue to put them into germ-free animals and understand uh, mechanisms for before and after intervention and protection against colonic inflammation. And so this was funded as a supplement award to the R1 in terms of being able to further test more than just a couple people, but now we have uh, 12 people that we'll be testing here soon. And also the combination. So before we put some of these um, fecal transplants into mice to study their effects on the colon tissue, we're applying shotgun metagenomics analysis of that stool inoculum from our beneficial study. And here's an example from an individual or three individuals where we are focusing in on genes associated with metabolism of amino acids, carbohydrates, um, cofactors, and vitamins also looking at number of xenobiotic biodegradation and metabolism that may also be contributing to um, colon carcinogenesis. And I think that it's exciting for us to really well characterize these inoculums that we're gonna be testing for efficacy. And um, it's a really exciting area that we hope can, uh, will expand soon. Our next human study plans, I just wanna put this out there, is that we, we really have established the feasibility of people being able to do our diet and physical activity interventions for three months now. Uh, we'd like to extend it to six months and doing it six months prior to an individual's scheduled colonoscopy so that we could do a six month intervention, collect a lot of the information we're used to collecting, but at the end of the six month in intervention in our control group and our rice bran and bean group be able to have a right and left colon tissue sample and see changes. And this is um, currently underway of our strategy for the next trial. And to do so, we're looking to be powered to do it in um, up to 100 individuals. Another future direction of this work is to study fermented rice bran. Um, there has been a number of different studies already done with fermentation of brown rice and the rice bran um, with different bacteria. And but now we'd like to use our information about native gut microbes to do these fermentations. And uh, this is also work that's underway. So I'd like to acknowledge and I'll end here some of the support. And I've, uh, there's been a number of studies and individuals um, involved in this research um, that it started out with looking at probiotics and the metabolism of rice bran as an RO3. The first benefit trial, with, uh, trial was funded as an R21 and multi-PI with Dr. Tiffany Weir here at CSU. And then I showed you some results from our current RO1. Um, we're also looking, like I said, this uh, NIFA program where we've been able to assess biomarkers of these foods using uh, multiple cohort studies that we've done or controlled studies that we've done. Um, some of the work with rice bran and its effects on the gut mucosal immunity were uh, with funding mechanisms from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, looking at pathogens. And then a lot of the bean and rice bran group, um, I, should, I should definitely highlight, we are excited to have some industry partnerships for supply of these foods in the quantities that we've needed to um, carry out the studies. And they've been very helpful um, in addition to the USDA to be able to, um, again, understand the genetics, the lots, the seasonal variations and, and, and the supply of these foods to do our studies in the future. So overall, I'll just end here. Um, again, lots of graduate students, postdocs, um, the work that I showed today, Erica Borison, and a lot of the publications have already been highlighted on there. I encourage you because this will be, um, if you're interested in any of those, you'll be able to go back and find them. 
um, but currently uh, some of the work was done also by Bridget Baxter in my lab. And it's not just that we do mouse and human. I do want to emphasize being at Colorado State University, we are able to a lot of, do a lot of diet intervention work in other animals, which has very much informed um, a lot of our strategies here. And so that's all I have today, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions. I think I might have one slide that I'll leave us on more than this one. Thank you very much, Dr. Ryan. What a compelling story. Um, you, you've provided. If, if folks would like to pose some questions, please either post them in, in chat or um, come on to the audio and, and, um, and, and pose them. I think I can see the chat if I stop share. So that well, I, I can also I can also read them to you if you'd like. Wonderful, thank you. I, I have one starter question if you if you don't mind, and that's about the the participant, the sort of acceptability and feasibility of of these uh, approaches and integrating them into the food. How did were, were there any reaction to them? Were they, were they able to tell what condition they were in in some of the trials or or, or no? Yeah, so I'd say. Um, you know, we were running our adults and children's studies at the same time, and the children were just adamant about wanting to be bl unblinded by the end. <laughs> you know, I think every week we had to kind of just hold them to say, look, four weeks isn't, you know, a lifetime. We'll, we'll, we'll tell and we, that was the first study that I'd ever had to go back to an IRB and unblind people. Um, you know, interestingly, just to see a difference, a lot of our colorectal cancer survivors, you know, was our first study. So they knew, they didn't really, none of them guessed or even tried to guess. Um, we did a lot of testing on the foods to see if people could tell. We actually did a meeting at, with a uh, survivor group meeting where we sampled all the different foods. So a lot of acceptability, palatability, uh, food variety was done. Um, and then the dose and the amount we include in really mattered, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of that identify so, so it wasn't like they just ate one food a day and we had our full dose in there. It was spread out to multiple different foods. There's a couple of questions in chat. Can you see those now? Um, Great, yes, I can. All right, so for your mouse model, I'm just gonna start from the top, if that's okay. For your mouse model studies, what are your average ages of the mice? Did old mice show differences that weren't as apparent in young mice or vice versa? Great question. So the um, colon carcinogenesis studies are done with they're starting with young mice because we need to take them out so long. Um, so those studies in terms of, we haven't compared young versus old or started the AOM DSS um, in older mice. But again, that is an opportunity, something we could do. We, for our pathogen infections and these impacts of these foods on the microbiome, we do see a difference. So for the gut mucosal immune response to pathogen infections, we see that our rice bran has a higher efficacy in very young, pigs as well as mice for protection against like diarrheal pathogens when compared to older mice. But uh, for the colorectal cancer, it's been uh, less investigated. However, and I'm gonna not long win this answer, but we do have young individuals in our trials now because there are people in their thirties um, that are developing adenomas and at risk for colon cancer. We've had colon cancer survivors in their thirties participate in our studies. So, um, we have not teased out the differences there, but it is a good idea in terms of um, how we move forward. The challenge we've had in studying younger people has been that a routine colonoscopy isn't always in the, um, in terms of how we move forward. They wouldn't necessarily have that routine scheduled colonoscopy where we're looking at colon tissue changes. Okay, um, let's see. The next one is, my question is about the physical activity piece of the trial. Okay, were adults already active at baseline or did they significantly increase activity over time because of the intervention? Provide more details on the prescription. Okay, the beneficial was our first study where we monitored physical activity. There was not, they were provided at each study visit the general ACS guidelines for physical activity. We did not provide an intervention yet per se for the physical activity. Um, all of our participants at the beginning of the study were meeting it. We have a physically active population here in Colorado and our individuals received education materials, but they did not have a prescribed intervention in this case. Uh, we wanted to just be able to assess differences if, if they existed in sedentary versus moderate to vigorous activity. But great questions. 
um, we are thinking a lot about, um, and Heather Leach, if she was here, could probably comment more, but different types of interventions that are being done uh, for improving um, outcomes in colorectal cancer. Uh, but again, was it a gradual progression? No, I mean, again, we would have to talk a little bit more if there was a prescribed intervention, which we didn't have. Okay, next question. You mentioned that level of rice bran and bean intake was quite high, how much, okay. So 30 grams of bean powder and 30 grams of rice bran is what we feed. And this is the, I mean, for a lab person, you could look at a 50 mil conical tube. <laughs> you could talk about it being in a, a cup, like less than a cup of a powder. Um, the, the reason we say it's high is not that it's not tall. We've, we've shown feasibility and tolerable. It's just much higher than anybody would ever currently include. If you eat a half a cup of beans per day, whole beans, that's about the same. And the reason we chose that dose is because we calculated the percent intake shown in animal models to be protective. And then we utilized that same dose to achieve that in people. Um, I don't feel like it's too high, but for example, if you said, I wanna eat brown rice to get my rice bran, you would have to eat six cups of brown rice to get that amount of rice bran. And I wouldn't want you to do that. <laughs> so, so the idea with the rice bran is that you don't need to eat that volume of the whole grain to get it. Any other questions? How high is the non-fiber carb content? So in human studies. So in the ones that we did, so non-fiber carb, so we have carbohydrate evaluated from the foods um, and each food may be different. So some foods, for example, like a hummus might be different than a soup, right? So it's hard for me to uh, maybe answer that clearly unless you wanna specify in more detail um, the rice bran versus the beans. Sorry, I, I just might need a little more clarity on that. But there is, I understand the starch and the carbohydrate content that's not considered fiber. Uh, we do try to macronutrient match as much as possible in our meals. But again, as you can all understand, we don't do 100% control of the diet. Um, okay, yes, concerned about these BMI individuals, correct. So we are monitoring isocaloric, okay? And we are trying to monitor carbohydrate content with a bulk of it being from fiber. Uh, sugar itself is also managed in these groups. So when, in our intervention, we are reducing sugar. And, and I would probably need a separate conversation to have a discussion about our healthy eating index, which covers all these components. So we do sh see shifts in different components of the HEI. Um, but yes, it is a concern. One thing about our studies is they are not designed to be weight loss, right? And so the, um, that, that's another piece in the absence of weight loss as a variable. Okay, I think there's another one. In your mouse model study, do you see or do you anticipate after post-fecal transplant from your human donor into the mice, a microbiome shift moving back to the mice's baseline microbiome over time? Yeah, it's a great question. So we have not left the animals after, um, you know, for, but the, idea is they've started out not autobiotic or germ-free, and so their microbial composition is next to nothing, or uh, very low, if you want to talk about the trace things that you might be able to detect. Um, and so when you're starting out germ-free, there's a number of different um, caveats and limitations, you know, but we, we have not done the antibiotic treatment where we wipe it out and then transphenate. So that's probably uh, where I would answer that question. Transverse colon studies, excellent question. No, we have not. We've been focusing very ascending, descending, but we do not recognize the importance of the transverse colon. And so it seems that most of our patients have been able to categorize from our path results as right, left, or rectal. And we, we don't, I guess I have a couple with transverse, but that, that'd be very interesting to include in our, in our future directions. Thank you so much for all these great questions and your interest. <laughs> any, any other um, burning questions? Well, thank you very much, Dr. Ryan. I really appreciate your time and, and um, uh, presentation and uh, really fascinating work and best wishes. Please let the Cancer Perfect 
please let Raj know how he can help you. Um, <laughs> and um, to I everyone know. else, <laughs> to, for, for everyone else, please remember that we have our um, seminar um, series on a monthly basis um, as usual, but we also have our retreat coming up where we'd love to have you participate. Um, and those dates will be um, uh, are available as well as the metabolism and uh, uh, well, actually it, the aging and cancer. Oh. Um, mini symposium if, if you're interested in one of the cross-cutting themes. That will be with um, some, you know, all of our basic science and clinician science colleagues all, all generating across all the programs. So, but it, once again, Jamie Stutes is my name. If you have any questions about the Cancer Prevention and Control Program, please feel free to email Raj or I. We're here to support and encourage all, all the uh, wonderful work that's being done. Thank you for being here and we'll see you next month or hopefully sooner at the retreat. Thank you. Yep. Take care. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you.